it not be taken amiss, I'd like to start with a bit of praise for our author tonight, <laughs> because it seems to me that he has at least three different sorts of readers to address himself to. One sort, probably mercifully rare, <laughs> is nerds like me, <laughs> who read his book with three different editions of the Beethoven String Quartets. That was uh, Baron Ryder. Oh, no, that was uh, Breitkopf and Hertel. This is Beethoven House. This is Baron Ryder. Plus a whole shelf of Beethoven books so that all the references can be checked. And of course, a recording <laughs> by uh, some outfit called the Takach Quartet uh, so that uh, those sorts of things can be checked. So that's one sort of reader. Oh, and of course, there's always, if we got these in grad school, you know, they, they have all our markings in them, so we have to keep those around too. Then there's another sort of readership, the sort of readership I see very well represented here tonight, students of performance who are reading every page with their scores, or at least their first violin parts in hand, <laughs> trying to see, OK, what is it, does he begin this phrase with an up, up bow or a down bow? Or how does he interpret this articulation mark? And then there's a third sort of reader, the sort who buys tickets to UMS concerts and just happens to love music even though they're not specialists in music. And so I, but wait, wait, we're in a bookstore. I have to start with a literati question. Those of you who have bought the book, look at the back cover. How on earth did you get Philip Roth to blurb your book? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we were lucky enough to work with Philip Roth on a project many years ago, and, and we've done it more recently. First of all, it was with the actor Philip Seymour Hoffman, and more recently with Meryl Streep, and it was uh, based around his novel Everyman, which is a wonderful short novel, um, cheerful book about death, uh, and we, I, I wanted to program it with Schubert's Death and the Maiden. And uh, Philip Roth had been coming to our concerts for some time in New York, and we have a, a rather aggressive a uh, wonderful manager who spied him in the audience and basically dragged him backstage. I think he hated going backstage. Um, but we, we had a nice meeting, and, and therefore I was brave enough to ask him if we could um, edit from his book and just take little excerpts uh, in this program, which then became um, musical examples and then going back and forth between words and music. Uh, so, that, so we had a connection with him, uh, and I was still pretty wary about asking him, um, but fortunately the same manager had more courage than I did, um, and he very kindly agreed to read it and, and write something. Very good. Now I come to my non-specialist question, or my attempt to put myself in a non-specialist perspective. The first chapter has you coming out to Boulder, the Ann Arbor of the West, <laughs> fresh out of conservatory, <laughs> to audition for the newly vacant position of first violinist. Now, thinking about this like a personnel director, um, why didn't the quartet simply promote the second violinist to first violin and have you audition for the second spot? It's a, that's a good question. And actually, the Juilliard Quartet did do that. When Bobby Mann retired, they did do that change. But um, certainly, our second violinist, uh, Carrie Schrantz, he expressed zero interest in becoming a first violinist. They're very, very different roles, which I discovered uh, some years ago when I was teaching, and the second violinist of the student group didn't show up. And uh, I would never do this now, but at the time I said, oh, that's fine, I'll play the second violin part and I can teach you at the same time. It was a disaster. I mean, I, I had no idea how difficult it was to play second violin, to be constantly changing roles, sometimes solo, sometimes with the viola, cello, first violin. Anyway, we got to the end of this session when I both didn't play very well and also didn't teach very well. And the first violinist of the group, this was in England, definitely an English sense of humor, she turned to me and she said, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> so so, so th those, rules are, those roles are not easily interchangeable, although some groups do swap, but not in, that, not in this case. So the video that they took at that first session, that audition, playing together for uh, Dennis Kormosai, mm -hmm. uh, 
you say in your book that when you looked at that video, you thought you looked like a shipwrecked sailor <laughs> clinging to a piece of driftwood. And you notice this difference between your nervous constricted body and the natural ease of the other three, the Hungarians. Um, and yet, when you said this to Andras, he said, well, already on the video, we sound good with you. So there's this kind of discrepancy between the visual impression and the oral impression. Could you comment on that? Yes, I, I think that I felt in the way I was playing better, and they must have enjoyed the way I was playing, than I did in the visual setup. And I think that Andras, our cellist, although he noticed what I was talking about in the sense that physically I was perhaps conforming to some sort of English stereotype of being a little bit sort of stiff and repressed as opposed to these kind of chill, laid-back Hungarians who were just moving much more. Um, but what he was encouraged by was the fact that I'd noticed it and was already thinking about how to improve it. And that's kind of the basis of quartet work is really, it's always a process. So he, he I was discouraged, but I think he was encouraged by that, the, the fact that I'd noticed. All right. Um, in chapter two, I'm sort of working through chapter by chapter. In the opening scene, you all are taking turns playing the opening motif of Beethoven's first string quartet, opus 18, number one. Mm -hmm. dun, da, 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 da. That. And after one round, your new colleagues burst into Hungarian, but we non-Hungarian speakers never learn what they are saying. Is it printable, what they're saying on page 44? Yeah, I actually did, I did in fact, consult with um, our second violinist, and he wrote out that dialogue, and it is, it is okay. It's, it's completely above board. It is actually about the Boeing. Okay. <laughs> but of course, of course, I didn't translate it because I wanted the reader to share my experience of not understanding what it was. Have you learned Hungarian since? Uh, just, I mean, my, my knowledge of swear words is even greater than it was 20 years ago. <laughs> Uh, and and kind of just generally useless phrases that I picked up. I just I wasn't a very good student, and I, I had a phrase book. Um, I can still remember Terhes Bajok, which means I am pregnant. Not a very useful thing to discover. <laughs> so I, I have a whole load of really sort of meaningless, useless expressions. So you do, later on in that chapter, you talk about the various leadership roles mm -hmm. that the first violinist has to assume. Um, I've got it open here. Could you yep. could you just read that that uh, that Which, top? I think the it's top one. the, the yep. top paragraph there. Given my inexperience, I was astonished that during my first weeks in Boulder, all three Hungarians spoke to me about the different aspects of leadership they expected from me, to structure the rehearsal so that we covered the necessary repertoire, to know when to move on a rehearsal conversation if we were getting bogged down in a given passage, and to come to rehearsal with plenty of musical ideas. Their approach seemed designed to help me not feel intimidated by their 18 years of prior quartet experience. I think this is a marvelous passage because this is not the sort of thing uh, non-musicians commonly think about, uh, the sort of burden falling on the first violin. I was wondering, have these roles changed at all over the years? Or have you, you assumed others? I think they've maybe they've changed a little bit just in my attitude to them. When I was first in the group, I felt a very fierce spotlight shining on me. And uh, I think a little bit as when someone starts teaching, maybe I kind of, I, I had some idea of needing to be a little bit sort of strong and a bit more strict and ferocious. And hopefully, I mean, the others might disagree with me. But now I think I feel my role is more to try and create a space where we can all say what we need to say in rehearsal. Certainly when I joined the quartet, I wasn't able to think in that broader way about it. I was just worried about whether I was fulfilling a, 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 a leadership role in a sort of more narrowly defined way. Well, the interpersonal dynamics uh, express themselves in texture too. You were, spoke at one point of the cellist feeling the obligation to counterbalance the excesses of the violinists, you know, the other end of the, the texture. That's, that's exactly right. And I think, I mean, we notice in the group that um, you know, people assume different roles even through the course of a rehearsal. Uh, so if, yeah, if I'm kind of rushing ahead, then someone else is going to kind of just try and rein that an in a little bit. And that's, that's one of the good but also frustrating things sometimes about having three colleagues is that they're always kind of counterbalancing you. And hopefully that, that leads to a good result in the end. 
You talk at some length about the slow movement in Opus 18, number one. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know the story, Beethoven is supposed to have asked one of his closest friends of that time in Vienna uh, what he thought this slow movement conveyed. Yeah. And the friend, whose name was Carl Amenda, said he thought it was a tragic scene of parting. And Beethoven said, that's right. It's the tomb scene in Romeo and Juliet. And one can see in Beethoven's sketches certain comments annotated for some reason in French, and I'd love to know why. Mm. Uh, Il prend le tombeau, he seizes the, 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 the tombstone. And I'm just wondering if knowing that story affects your interpretation of your, your performance and how. Yeah. I mean, when I first joined the quartet, I was straight out of school and I felt very unqualified. And one of the ways I tried to counter that was to read as much as possible. And so this kind of story was a little bit of a, it was, I was very grateful for it because it gave some kind of indication of where to go with it. So the opening violin melody, um, certainly just trying to get inside that, the sadness, um, the sense also of unease and unrest, uh, it's always very helpful to have those stories, even though a little part of me is, is still a tiny bit suspicious of that whole anecdote. You know, I think that composers like the rest of us write their own narratives, and um, you, we, we don't know for sure whether Beethoven, kind of as he was working on the sketches, had this idea, but, but maybe at the end of it he thought, yeah, that kind of fits the music quite well. It, it's, a, it's a kind of a circular thing, I think. No, you're, you're left to ask which comes first, yeah. the chicken or egg conception or, right. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, uh, uh, you know, Beethoven, you, you mentioned this and actually paid quite a bit of attention to it. Uh, Beethoven writes the first version. Yeah. Of course, sends it off to, uh, to a man, and then he revises it and then has to write his friends, please don't hand this quartet around. I've, I've, I've changed everything. I've just learned how to write quartets. Mm -hmm. And you actually go into some of the differences. That, but do you think he was overstating the case? Exactly. I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a very detailed monograph, um, probably over 100 pages. Yeah, that, Janet Levy's. Right, right yeah. which, which is a very impressive work that compares these two different versions of Opus 18, number one. Uh, but at the same time, when I actually listen to the two versions, I don't hear it to be as different as Beethoven said. So when Beethoven said, only for the second version had I learned how to write string quartets, that's a little extreme, because actually the first version is still very worth playing. But for me, it's an interesting statement because it tells you everything about how he felt about that process of composition and how important the transformation, the idea of transformation was. And I think that's, that's it's not so much that the two versions are very different, but that he, when he was working, wanted to feel like he was always making transformations. This suggests one of the more, uh, or I should, should say most appealing aspects of this book is that Ed is always cutting back and forth between historical context for Beethoven's compositions understanding what's going on in the music and calling on some secondary literature to arrive at that understanding, and then the vagaries of touring <laughs> and performance. It's at about this point that the telling detail comes out <laughs> that he was awakened by his alarm clock in a hotel, stumbled into his tuxedo because it was 5 p.m. and he had to be ready to play that night. And then he noticed that it was actually 5 a.m. And there he was in his tux. <laughs> you continually talk about or make connect the attitudes toward music making and toward life in general. The Hungarians, as you say, chill, more flexible, more adventurous. Um, less uptight. Has this changed at all over the years? I think you'd have to ask them. <laughs> uh, I mean, certainly, it, I'm sure that being in that company for the last 20 years, uh, I've had to learn how to be more flexible. And I mentioned in the book some of the 
mishaps that occurred to us on the, on the road. And some of those stories that they've told me, for example, they had a quartet vehicle that um, literally went up in flames on a French motorway. Uh, and, but they don't tell it as a horror story. They tell it as, you know, we managed to get the instruments out and, uh, and the luggage out. And, um, and they tell me this story as we're driving along in a car of the same, <laughs> car of the same model, which they purchased afterwards. And, and so, I mean, over the years, I haven't had anything extreme like that happen to me. But I think as a student, um, I, I had this sort of idealistic sense that, you know, you, you need to prepare in exactly the right way for a concert day. You get exactly the right amount of sleep, eat the right things, all this stuff. After five years playing in the Tokach Quartet, I realized none of that really counts. You've just got to be really flexible and <laughs> deal with situations that are often outside of your control. So in that respect, at least, I probably am a little less, less uptight than... Um, than I used to be, but I'm looking forward to having an afternoon nap before uh, Saturday's concert. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sets up my next question beautifully. Um, at a given moment, I think it's in the next chapter, uh, the chapter titled Fracture, hmm. that Gabor Ormai uh, reassures you yeah. with the words, there are three elements, your professional life, your personal life, and your health. Mm -hmm. If two of those are going well, you can manage. <laughs> Uh, and this is just before we hear about his cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. So over 20 years later, how true do you still find that advice to be? Well, I mean, it was a, it, it, Gabor was, when I joined the quartet, um, I spent quite a lot of time with him because he was newly uh, divorced. And so we, we, he had more time on his hands. And uh, he, he kind of, he really helped me get used to being in a string quartet and he had many pieces of advice but of course that was very sadly uh, not borne out that in the case of his his health uh, he couldn't continue and he died um, six months later after his diagnosis and that that brought about a very profound change for me in the group because um, although I was very upset by it uh, I had only known him for about a year whereas my Hungarian colleagues had grown up with him it was like losing a brother and so from sort of being this, this new kid with a lot of focus on me, I suddenly had to change my role. As, as Kauri said to me, he said, Ed, you're just going to have to be the strong one because we can't be. And so after 18 months of being in the group, it very much changed the dynamics of the group, I think. As a musicologist, I'm always blown away when a performer makes the same kind of connection that I've insisted on in lectures. Mm -hmm. And one of those is your connection of the slow movement of Opus 59, number two, with uh, Leonora's aria, Kom Hoffnung, uh, E major, both of them. And she's saying, Kom Hoffnung, lass die letzten Stern. You know, don't let the, the last star fade before the, the one who needs a comfort can, 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 can latch on to that comfort. Uh, e major is a fire key for Beethoven and for many of his contemporaries, and that's the fire in the sky. And I thought, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and when, I'm, I'm sorry, but performers, this gentleman reads Jams, the Journal of the American Musicological Society, and quotes articles from it, and that is really, really cool. <laughs> Chapter four, recreation. <laughs> you open the fourth chapter, describing a sudden power outage during your performance of Schubert's Death in the Maiden, string quartet. You've almost gotten to the end of the slow movement where the maiden seems to be giving in to death and you're able to finish in the dark. Tell me, is there any movement of any Beethoven string quartet you'd be willing to try playing <laughs> in the dark? Are you planning to turn the lights off on Saturday? <laughs> no, you're not playing the piece on Saturday. I, I know which one I'd turn the lights off for. <laughs> which one? Yeah. Slow movement of Opus 135. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, we were extremely lucky that night that the lights went off just in the last 10 bars. Very easy chords to memorize. Uh, it, it made sense dramatically. If it had happened 20 bars earlier, it would have been a complete train wreck. Uh, 
I think the short answer is no, we, we don't. I mean, there are some very impressive younger groups who are doing Bartok cycles by memory, that sort of thing. But um, no, I think we'd be in trouble. But there have been a few times since then when the lights have gone out in, in relatively easy music, Borjak American Quartet. Um, that, was, that was tough because it, it, it was a two-way thing. It went down very dim and our playing became rather tentative, but we kind of continued. And then it went completely black and we stopped right away. So I think, no, you, you wouldn't want to hear that. <laughs> in that same chapter, you're just on the threshold of recording the late quartets. And you talk about Beethoven's part writing becoming uh, so complex mm -hmm. that balancing the parts is really an issue. I mean, what do you do? How do you proceed when every part seems to be the melody? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really difficult. And it's the sort of thing that when you come back to these pieces, you, you've, you've found a kind of a temporary solution the previous time you played it. And so there's certain passages you just know when you start rehearsing them again that issues of balance are going to come up. Because one person kind of thinks they've got the primary melody, but after all, and it's, it's, it's interestingly quite often happens for the poor cellist that maybe the first violin gets the melody, as happens um, in, the, in the slow movement of Opus 127, and then the cello gets the melody next. But in the meantime, the first violin has a kind of nice new sat descan over the top. And so uh, if the first violinist is feeling a little arrogant, if you can imagine such a thing, <laughs> uh, they might sort of, they might suggest, well, you know, we've already heard the, the melody. I just played the melody and yeah, you've got the melody, but I've got something new. So that's more important than the melody. You know, obviously a cellist is going to say, give me a break, I've got the melody. <laughs> so, uh, but those, those are the sort of things that we end up debating. And, and it, we usually have to fudge it in terms of percentages. So in that particular conversation, it will be, I have to concede that it's a cello tune. So is it like 70% cello, 30%? You know, I might agree to that in rehearsal and then come the concert, I might just push it up to 35%. <laughs> Well, you've got register on your side that's in that right. passage, right? That's you're, true. You're going to exactly. float above it in any case. That's, are you a cellist? That's exactly <laughs> what he says. <laughs> Far from it. Um, speaking of Opus 127, um, this is going to sound really nerdy, but I've never read prose that managed to make a recording session sound exciting. Uh, <laughs> you take us through the recording process for this quartet, and you liken the difference between live performance and recording to the difference between live theater and filmmaking. Could you elaborate on that yes. a little bit? Well, and, and I had to learn this the hard way. I mean, the first time we made a this together, I had no real experience of recording before. And uh, when you have the microphone so close, it's like having the camera on your face. And so obviously the gestures that you magnify to project in a hall a uh, particular bow stroke that kind of throws a sound out to the back of a hall. With a microphone there, it's just going to sound really obnoxious. You know, it's just going to be in your face too much. Uh, and similarly, in the quiet dynamics, um, just as with the sort of minute changes in the facial expression, um, you, can, you can really do wonderful things with a microphone right there that wouldn't necessarily carry in a hall. So that's, that's, the, that's the similarity, I think. And in lieu of a director and a camera crew, you've got the producer and the sound engineer, right? That's right, and uh, we're, very, we're very lucky we've worked with the same team, and our producer is a great psychologist. He knows how to deal with fragile egos, which is a very important part of the job. He's got a number of tricks he does. You know, if I, ma if I make the same mistake, uh, let's say eight times in a row, and he's just been hearing that mistake, he'll, he'll, he'll know that I've got a bit of a thing about it. So instead of saying, you know, Ed, we really need to cover that again, He'll, he'll usually find something else to say, like, um, you know, just 10 bars, he'll, he'll mention a bit like 10 bars before or 10 bars afterwards. He'll say, you know, I really like the character, the way you're playing that. Could you just try it again with a slightly different tone color and just keep playing? And he'll make sure that I'm covering the bit that he actually needs. Um, and then I'll be focusing on something else. And the thing is, the problem is I know him so well, I know when he's doing that. <laughs> Um, you know when you're being handled. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know it, but it still is quite effective. So we'll get to the end of the passage, and he'll sort of say, nice color, and I'll say, yeah, and did you get that bit as well? And he'll go, yeah. Uh, close to that passage, um, you uh, reproduce what I think is an excellent example of uh, what in yoga class they call monkey mind. That is, you're, you're playing, you're trying to concentrate, and you're thinking about three dozen other 
things. Could, could you read that passage? Yeah, so we're, we're playing along, the session is going, my brain's whirling. We can't use that one. Just the first take, plenty of time to improve, out of tune. Stop evaluating, just play. Carrie and I not together, microphone so inhibiting. What a wonderful opportunity to record this music. Saccharin, <laughs> concentrate, relax bowing arm, arpeggio unclear. Just focus on the music. One of the most perplexing adverbs in such situations becomes just. <laughs> just play. What is just playing? Thank you very much. Um, you talk about the challenges of performing a solemnly paced piece like the Heilige Dankesan mm -hmm. uh, in different halls. Yeah. Uh, how long does it take to size up the acoustical peculiarities of a, of a new hall? Well, it's, it's difficult. We always have a stage rehearsal. Um, if, we're, if we're in a place the night before, like here, it's great because we can go in the morning session. Um, even between morning and evening, things change. Stage mm. managers get a little annoyed with us because we fix our positions on the stage. And we're quite sensitive, just like two or three inches, someone should move a certain way. And so they mark it. And then we go back in the evening. We're like, no, we, we couldn't have sat like that. It doesn't feel comfortable. Um, and it's a little bit the same with an acoustic. You sort of think you're getting used to something in the morning. You react in the evening. And then the audience comes in, and it's a different acoustic anyway. Um, so you're always second guessing a little bit, but with something like a slow movement, it really affects matters, the, the Heiliger Dankgesang, because you're always thinking about how to sustain a very long melodic line. Um, and that's easier in a place that's resonant than somewhere that's a very dry acoustic. So that is one of the things that affects the tempo that you play. For those of you who know it, this is a, a, a famous movement, alternating this uh, thankful prayer with a dance of resurgent strength, neue Kraft fühlend, except the second time it comes back, it's not neu anymore, yeah, it's just right. Kraft, right? Mm -hmm. But you make such an interesting comment about this alternation of opposites. You say, the sudden changes make the character of each section seem increasingly provisional. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's a, well, it's an in, I mean, when you have an autobiographical story around a piece of music, it's both helpful but also a trap. And so when I first was getting to know the piece, as with Opus 18 No. 1, I was very grateful for any guidance. And so here's the idea that Beethoven was, was ill and then he recovered and then he wrote this piece. Great. But actually, when you start digging into it, it's not as simple as that. Um, first of all, he had many serious illnesses throughout his life. Um, and although it's true that he did feel he was recovering, just a few days later he felt really bad again. And so that's a little bit where I got the sense that these, these sudden changes of mood, um, as it, if it was just a movement where you had the hymn of thanksgiving and then new strength, and then that was the end of the movement, that's one thing. But once you start displacing the new strength, going back to a chorale, and then having the strength again, which then gets displaced again, then by the end of the movement, you seem to be talking about something completely different. And it, and it begins to feel um, not so much like a physical recovery, but a, but a statement about a, a spirit that is somehow leaving the body. I mean, that's how it feels to play it. And then it becomes more of a meditation on death than a, than a statement about recovery. Well, when you're flipping a psychological page back and forth, after a while, you're not sure which one to take more seriously. Exactly, yeah. Chapter 6, Alternative Endings. <laughs> Put this in context, the B-flat major quartet, Opus 130. Six movements, but there are two different versions of it. One with the Grand Fugue, the Große Fuge, as a finale, which is this monster, goes through the motions of packing four movements into a single finale. And then a supposedly lighter rondo finale that was the last major work that Beethoven completed. You say something really startling about the, the, the Grand Fugue. You call it a harbinger of the revolution of 1848 with its evocation of unruly individual voices and threat of chaos. <laughs> I have never heard that interpreted in political terms. Could you talk about that a bit? 
Well, I just, I think Beethoven was writing, obviously, during a turbulent period. He, he kind of, his whole middle period evolved from the Napoleonic Wars and the, uh, the two invasions of Napoleon's army in Vienna. Uh, and, he, and he writes very graphically about the, what it was like to, to hear the sounds of the cannons and uh, the, the sense of the injured soldiers on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of, of a sense of, in his music of that kind of uh, tension between order uh, and, and chaos and partly the material that he uses. He is juxtaposing very contrasting material and that creates immense challenges in terms of the unity of the piece. So actually when I, when I made that statement at the end, um, of course it's a, it's a stretch, <laughs> but I was aware of the sense of um, things about to uh, dissolve in, in Europe and it's strange the way works of art do seem to predict events in ways that we can't expect. And so with hindsight, that's, that's how it appeared to me. Well, it's stretching that keeps us flexible. So <laughs> thank you for stretching in that direction. Do you think that this is really two different quartets, depending on which finale one chooses? Playing, playing the piece does feel quite different, um, because when you have the, the, the fugue as an ending, it's a, it's a long, very difficult piece to play, physically very demanding. And uh, frankly, one's a little bit intimidated for the whole previous five movements. You, you feel like you have to save some energy. Um, and, and so you always are kind of thinking that that's where the climax of the piece is. And I'm sure that subconsciously it affects the way you play it. With this lighter alternative finale, which is, by the way, is just as hard to play, if not more difficult, because it's kind of quite um, graceful, at the same time very fast. Um, but the emotional balance of the piece is different because the, the very soulful cavatina which precedes the, that finale and, and the fugue then kind of becomes an emotional center of the piece that you really you sort of submerge yourself in it uh, and then you withdraw into this kind of lighter last movement. So it, 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 it does feel like a different piece to play. Yeah. Well, it's the, the, the strange thing. I mean, the cavatina is going to be the center of emotional gravity. Yeah. Both the Grosse Fuga and the Rondo finale start with a G, yeah. right? Yeah. Only with the Rondo finale, it's pop, 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 and it's, it's as if, it's as though, I, I, and, and bless your heart for saying, you know, the, the quartet is really kind of proceeding the way one might expect a divertimento to proceed. Uh, you know, the Viennese of that day, the <laughs> divertimento, five movements with a central slow movement framed by dancers. And you get kind of that pattern, you know, with the uh, with the uh, uh, the sort of bagatelle and then the andante, yeah. um, and then the and then the the the, uh, uh, the, the Deutsche, uh, alla tedesca, and then that cavatina, mm -hmm. and you're gobsmacked. You're just gobsmacked. Now, if you're taking the finale that he eventually gave us, the substitute finale, it's turning a little bit into a divertimento again. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're not, then, oh. Yeah, it, and it, it's a funny thing because um, we recorded uh, all of these pieces back uh, 2000 to 2004, and uh, I, I must say I hate listening to any of our old recordings. I think it's a, you can't win listening to recording because if you like something that you did, then you just worry that you can't do it anymore. And uh, if you don't like it, then it's just annoying to listen to. And in that latter category, when I was, it, there's, with the CD, you're faced with this problem with the two finales, because how are you going to put it on a disc? Um, so we ended up doing the movements all the way through to the fugue. So you, you hear the piece like that, and then we just tagged on the finale as the last track. The great disadvantage of that is that sometimes, I, I, recently, it was played on the radio, and, and they just played it straight through like that, so, which is, of course, not at all how Beethoven intended it. Um, <laughs> And what I noticed going back to it is that we, we had a system when we were recording these difficult movements that we thought we should record them first thing in the morning when we were sort of sufficiently caffeinated and uh, feeling a little braver and we could kind of go for it. So um, we didn't record that alternative finale right after we had recorded the cavatina. And to my ears, you can hear that on the disc because uh, the cavatina ends in a particular very resigned way and then I can hear that early morning caffeine from like the next day or later, the way we start off, it's like incredibly fast. 
And so now I hope when we play it, I mean, the first like eight, nine lines of that are pianissimo. It's a very extreme marking. And I think there's a sense that although it is a change of character, it's, it's quite tentative. You know, it's like he doesn't quite, he hasn't quite thrown off the cavatino. It takes a little while. And you, you don't get that on our disc um, because of the way we recorded it. But that's a nice thing to come back to these pieces and have a, have a second chance. You're going to play it this weekend with the fugue? Uh, no, with the, with the substitute finale. With the this, substitute yeah. finale. We, we, do the whole, we end the whole cycle um, with playing 1-3-0 with the fugue. Um, it's, it's a very divisive issue, this, and I mentioned in the book a particular uh, audience where in the program it said we were going to play the fugue and actually we were playing the alternative finale and people get quite disappointed if they don't hear the version that they want to hear. So the way we, we solve that in the cycle is to play it both ways, once at the beginning of the cycle, once at the end. It does mean you need to come to more than one concert. <laughs> yes, it does. It means exactly that. <laughs> um, have you ever been tempted to perform the quartet in chronological order, the way Andras Schiff goes through yeah. the Beethoven sonatas. You know, some, yeah, some people do that. I think not for the simple reason that we, um, we recorded all the Opus 18s in, in two sessions, and they are, they are incredibly hard. I mean, they might be, because of what followed, we, I think we underestimate the, the importance of the Opus 18s. And um, to the idea of playing three Opus 18s in a concert is... is mind-bogglingly difficult to me. So, and I think also for those few people who decide not to come to all six concerts, uh, we do like to sort of have some sort of um, progression uh, in each concert so that you can hear that incredible change that happened with Beethoven through the middle period and then to the late. On page 199, I've, I've got it open. If you're, you've got it open too. Um, I think there's a very telling passage that I'd like to hear you read. The degree of stillness in the hall during the last section of the slow movement encouraged us to linger over some of our favorite moments, stretching out the chords in the ecstatic climax that preceded the ethereal ending, waiting longer than usual after an elemental pianissimo chord that uses only the uncompromisingly bare intervals between an A and D and seems to look back even further than the Lydian mode. We were taken far out of ourselves, liberated from the confines of individual personalities as we surrendered to the music. A blissful state made possible all those years ago by a lonely convalescent, not entirely confident of his recovery. Above all, this is why we play string quartets, weathering the sometimes fragile nature of our dependent relationships to enjoy such concert experiences that reaffirm the leap of faith we have made in each other. Amen. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This is great. Thanks so much. <laughs>